Yo, and welcome into championship week of pre-gaming the SEC. That's right. We've made it, as CD always says. It is what, CD? It has flown by, and here we are already heading into December. The first weekend of December is always a special weekend here in this conference because it's SEC championship game weekend, and uh, you know this. Uh, it's a, it's a, a game that's near and dear to both of our hearts and, and uh, one that you know, I feel like I got a, a special connection to having played in the first four of these and watched it evolve into what it is today. It's uh, it's kind of crazy, man. Yeah, you're right. Like you were on the ground floor of this deal. I mean, the SEC was obviously innovative in bringing the conference championship game and now to what it's grown to. But you had a chance to really live through that. It was funny. I think back to to the that that season when they implemented the first SEC championship game, and you, there was really no precedent. You had no right. idea really what to expect. You go through the regular season and all of a sudden we're in Birmingham, Alabama, the second home to the Alabama Crimson Tide playing them in a, in a championship game. Like it just, I remember how weird it seemed. And now to watch it, you know, when, when we moved after two years to Atlanta from Birmingham, it took on this whole new Super Bowl feel. Yeah. Uh, it's been often duplicated and tried to, to be replicated, but nobody has, has been able to have the same success that the SEC has. It's uh, it's it's crazy how how uh, special that that game is the whole weekend and and how much the fans really make a a big part of that that weekend being so special. Yeah, and I was fortunate enough to play in two of those games. Two thousand five, we fall short against Georgia. Two thousand seven, we get a championship victory against Tennessee. And I will say this, and we're going to preview LSU versus Georgia, the matchup we know we have coming this weekend. It is the second biggest thing that you can do as a team in college football is win the SEC championship game. Obviously, we're biased here, but when you take a look around, if you don't win the Natty, the next biggest thing is to win the SEC championship game, in, in my opinion, at least. It, it is. It's a huge thing. It's a Coach Burr used to talk about it being a ring game, right? And he would always quote uh, one of the golfers that would talk about, you know, you can't take money to the grave, but you could take, you could take championships to the grave. And this is a, a special one for those that are in this conference. And ironically, you know, these guys at Georgia, this will be their fourth that they've played in, uh, you know, for, for folks that are upperclassmen, seniors, and they've won none of them. Like they've won more national championships than they won SEC yeah. championships. It's hard to believe, isn't it? That is wild. And that's definitely something I want to get into whenever we preview that game. Now, you know, we say pre-gaming. For the latter portion of the show, we start every week holding beers, right? We go to yeah. hold my beer. And typically as the host, I do a bad job. I always take the first hold my beer. I don't give my co-host Chris Doring the opportunity. Maybe I steal his some weeks, maybe multiple weeks in a row. So wait till the end of the season, wait till the last regular season episode. And I'll say, Hey, go ahead. Uh, CD hold my beer. I, I am going to, uh, I'm going to, I don't know how to put this exactly because somebody is going to be passing a beer to hold. I'm not sure who he's handing the beer to, to hold. Perhaps it's to Kirk Herb street. Perhaps it's to some of the other folks in the media. Uh, it's Tennessee for me. And, and uh, a lot of people picking against Tennessee this past weekend, as they traveled to Nashville to take on the Vanderbilt Commodores, uh, a team that had been coming off of two straight sec wins playing against uh, a team that was devastated by the loss. Uh, to South Carolina a week before the in injury to Hinden Hooker. You know, I understand the mindset of why you might think that that could be a potential upset spot, but I, I want to credit Tennessee. Uh, they, they, they said, Hey, hold my beer. We're going out here to show you nothing changed. Yeah. And that offense putting up 56 points, maybe more impressively, the defense pitching a shutout there against a very confident um, Vanderbilt Commodore offense. Uh, yeah. they, they, they wrong some rights. I know it doesn't, you know, take away the loss and put them back into the position they were in before, but I, I think, uh, they deserve a lot of credit for being able to circle the wagons after that devastating loss to South Carolina. They absolutely do. We'll get into Tennessee. I think in a little bit, when we're talking CFP rankings, oh, look, let's just go ahead actually to do it, do it right now. How are they, uh, behind Alabama in the CFP? I, I rankings? have no idea. I they have hold, no idea. They hold every metric over Alabama strength of schedule, head to head, uh, top 25 victories, any metric you want to throw out there, Tennessee is ahead of Alabama. The, the committee, I, you can't explain that one for me. And if they try to use the Hendon hooker injury, that is ludicrous because yeah. one, 
a team should never be punished because a guy got hurt. Football is a violent sport. People are going to get hurt in football. It's just, it's going to happen. Uh, happen. That's why the healthiest team typically has the best chance to win yeah. at the end because it's so hard to stay healthy. So that part of it, but also they've got Joe Milton who started games at Michigan. He started games at Tennessee. He just went out there last week. If they try to use that, I will, I will tell boo to come on this show and I will yell at him for 30 minutes. That's the only thing. That's it. What else could they explain it by? I mean, you, you hit it. The metrics that every other metric that the college football playoff committee is held to falls the way of the Tennessee Vols. And, and maybe the most important metric, hey, we beat you. Like that, wh- <laughs> when does yes, that? Like, we played. You know, when you have the same number of w- wins and losses and you beat the other team, I mean, it's, that's, that's like the simplest tiebreaker ever, right? Yes, it's like, well, look what South Carolina and how they beat them. Yeah, they beat up on them. Does that matter when we have the same record? I've beaten more teams that had a higher ranking than you did. And, oh, yeah, we beat you. Yeah. And I'm not even hating on Alabama. Don't take this as Alabama hate. But if you have to pick between the two, it's Tennessee. Just like I said two weeks ago, if you have to choose between Tennessee and LSU at the end, I thought it should have been Tennessee. Yeah. Tennessee won the head-to-head. I, look, the score was out of hand, in fact, in that one. But like, it doesn't matter if I beat you by half a point. I know you can't do that. But if I did, I beat you on the football field that we played on, and I have the same record, and I hold every other metric over you. Makes no sense to me. Yeah. Now, I, I and unfortunately, the thing that maybe has me more mad than than Alabama being ahead of Tennessee is the fact that Ohio State is ahead of both of those teams right now. After you know. Losing at home by three touchdowns plus in really the only game that matters on your entire season schedule. What what else do you hang your hat on? And here we are. I saw that the the college football playoff projector, like they have a 77% chance of getting in. Yeah. Like, how can you lose your last game by three touchdowns and still be deserving of playing in the college football championship? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's one that certainly is up for debate. So I had to get that in there when we were talking Tennessee because, again, when you have the type of season that they had and it's it's going head-to-head with somebody else and you're talking about resumes and every single check is in your box and your column and not the other, I, you can't help me get there. So we'll see how hey, that plays out. Let me ask you a question, though. It, it really is kind of crazy to think about what could have happened, right? If, if Tennessee would have stayed at five where they were before, mm-hmm. I'm not so sure they get in anyway. I think if USC wins out and wins the Pac-12 championship, they probably would have jumped right. Tennessee anyway. So, like, I don't know if that it's any solace for Vol fans, but if TCU wins and USC wins the Pac-12 championship, you probably wouldn't have gotten in there anyway. I, I, I think it probably would have fallen that way, uh, but it, 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 I don't know that it takes any of the pain away necessarily. Yeah, look, it, even if these teams finish at six and seven, I'm still mad. I'm still mad because I think it speaks to the process of the committee, and you have to explain that to me. So it's not even really if they got into the playoff and the other team didn't. Certainly, that's part of the conversation if it happens. But even if it stays as it is, you still can't explain that to me. And, I, and I'm going to ask questions about where the rest of your mindset is. Yeah, like that, like That's my issue. It's not just getting into the playoff. It's why would you do that? Yeah. And if you're like, ah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. Or you wouldn't rank the teams like you do, or it should matter at least. Yeah. So, all right, I had to, I had, I had to spread that to our SEC brethren. Even the, look, Alabama fans, don't worry, I'm not talking bad about you. Like you, you're, you're Alabama, right? But even you have to look at this and be like, yeah, you're probably right. At least, hey, uh, hey I they, did last week. They, they have not. That, that's not the uh, indication that I've gotten, at least from social <laughs> media responses right. to my top six that I put out on Saturday night on the SEC network. But, um. I, I do think it's funny because rarely do we ever listen to Alabama or specifically Nick Saban lobby. Yeah. Uh, they don't re- really find themselves in that position much, but to, to hear a lot of the Alabama fans trying to rationalize how they should be involved in the uh, college football playoffs, yeah. a little funny to me when you haven't, haven't won a conference championship, you haven't won a division championship. I mean, it's not a lot to hang your hat on if you're yeah. tied right now. All right, let's move on. My hold my beer has to go. It has to go to Shane Beamer in South Carolina. Two weeks in a row, they go get it done. They did what they did to Tennessee. That game was at home, and you wondered, could they continue that? Because two weeks ago, when they were in the swamp, 
that didn't look like a team that was even related. They didn't look like a distant cousin to the team that beat Tennessee. And four weeks before that, they were at home against Missouri, and the quarterback admitted he had no idea what the game plan was. Like, <laughs> that's not a good sign. And, and your offense is completely anemic for the most yeah. part in that that three week stretch, other than the the Vandy win. And then you go out and and do what you did against Tennessee and back it up with another performance against. Yeah. Uh, Clemson, the way that they did against a the rival road. that you've been playing since 1896, yeah. a rival in which you have lost seven straight times to a rival that has become one of the standards of college football. And you go get a victory in that game playing off of what you did 63 to 38 against Tennessee. The first time in your program history, you have back-to-back -to -back top 10 wins. I mean, talk about some juice and Shane Beamer, when he was asked when they were one and two, Whoever Phil was that asked the question in the press conference, if his team basically <laughs> quit, he said, hell no, Phil. What kind of question is that? I loved it, by the way. It's one of my best sound bites of the year. That team was ready to go. Like, he didn't ever lose that locker room. They, look, they have some challenges. And when you look at the roster, the schematics at some points during the season. But after that one and two start, they roll off four victories in a row. They have the loss that you mentioned against Mizzou. Hard to explain, but then they come back and they beat Vanderbilt. And then they have one you can't explain again against Florida. But anytime he's had that moment that was hard to explain, Shane Beaver's got his team ready to go very quickly. Tennessee again. But the Clemson victory, it means the world. That's a team that is a true rival. That is a team that you recruit against every single day. You probably do against Tennessee often, but not every single day. Day. That is a team within your own state. It is a team that in the series history has 72 wins to your 43. So anytime you can get a victory in that game, it's massive. You felt the excitement. You felt the emotion through the TV with Shane Beamer. You and I have said it a thousand times. No coach in the country fits his program better than Shane Beamer. He just, does. he should be the South Carolina head football coach. And this can unlock something. If they, go to a bowl game, which they did uh, a year ago, right? They had success in a bowl game. If they can go to a bowl game, get another victory, have a nine and four season with who they beat. Yeah. This is a program that is on the ultimate rise right now. And so I've got to go hold my beer with Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks. Yes, I, I think you know this, by the time we get to this point in the season, there's a lot of teams that are ready for a break. There's a lot of teams that are ready to shut it down, go to the off season. Yeah. If there's one fan base, one group of coaches, one team that's not, it would be South Carolina <laughs> yeah. because they feel like they've taken it to another level and they've hit their stride. And uh, it's kind of sad to see the season come to the end. Obviously, you start turning your attention to the next year and what you know you could build on from, from this year. Starts with Spencer Rattler. Let me ask you yeah. this question. You think he comes back next year? I think he needs to. Yeah. I think he needs to come back. I think that's somebody that showed that there is a glimpse of what we thought he would be his entire college career in his body. Like we have seen it now against really good football teams in Tennessee and Clemson build on that. Now I know you lost your coordinator days after that Satterfield goes to Nebraska, right? So there's questions to be asked there, but if you feel like they bring somebody in that fits what you do well, I think Spencer Rattler could continue to develop and could get to maybe a version of what we thought he was going to be, which was a top NFL draft choice. Yeah. Now, I, I think you look at uh, what he's done the last two weeks, particularly against uh, South Carolina a week ago. He 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 did everything that you yeah. could have asked him to do. He, he executed as well as, as I've seen him execute, even dating back to his Oklahoma days. Knew where to go with the football, threw it accurately, anticipated, moved around, bought time. I mean, it was a... A Spencer Rattler that I think we had all hoped to see because remember in the offseason that might have been a top three story in the SEC the fact that Spencer Rattler was coming to South Carolina coming yeah. to this conference and you before that 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 uh, Tennessee game he wasn't even a top 10 quarterback in the SEC no. based upon production this year eight touchdowns nine interceptions to that point and then goes on this run that he has the last two weeks it's crazy yeah it's definitely going to be key to see who they hire as their offensive coordinator because it wasn't consistent it certainly had flashes of greatness over the last couple of weeks. It had flashes early in the season. It also had dips uh, in Gainesville, right? That was an anemic offense. And so you're going to be starting over a coordinator, but that doesn't always necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Last point on South Carolina, they're currently 15th in recruiting rankings. 
So they're seeing it pay off on the recruiting trail as well. They're ahead of Arkansas, Florida State, TCU, Michigan, Texas A&M, Ole Miss, Auburn, um, you know, Mississippi State, NC State. So they're doing what they need to do right now, cashing in on all the things that they've built up in equity on the football field. Again, man, this is a program. Shane Beamer knows what it looks like to win 11 games there. Just you got to watch out. And I, I know you and I have talked about him for a couple of years now. Some people like to clown us. I'm just saying watch out for that program because they're starting to show signs of something that can be consistent. I asked Shane when he came on our show on Monday about what that, uh, that Saturday looked like after playing at noon in terms of uh, lighting up the, the phones. Yeah. He was using that momentum to be in touch with a lot of different recruits out there. And, and what, like you said, what a great advertisement for where we're going, how close we are and what, you know, those guys can do yeah. to help get you to that next tier of, of teams in the sec and beyond. All right, CD, before we move on to previewing the sec championship game, was there anything else during last week, uh, rivalry weekend, obviously. So a lot of marquee matchups that stood out to you, good, bad, or indifferent. Well, let, let's start with uh, maybe the biggest story of the, of the sec weekend outside of South Carolina's victory over Clemson was LSU. So I, I, I hate to bring up a sore subject, but I'm disappointed and I, I really have no skin in the game, but I, I felt like, you know, I, I was a believer in the evolution of this team. I felt mm -hmm. like I was a believer in the growth of the quarterback, Jaden Daniels. I've been promoting Matt house and how great the defense has been all year long. And then they go out there and they lose this game at Texas A&M, a team that had only won, what, one SEC game prior to, to beating yeah. the Tigers. I, I, I guess the question, and maybe nobody better to ask it to than you, and, and I've kind of talked about this a lot this week, but was was is LSU as good as maybe what we saw them capable of being, or was that just a crazy three-game stretch where Jaden Daniels was throwing the ball all over, using his legs yeah. to run, not throwing interceptions, defense doing everything right, and they just somehow light, lost that light, lightning in a bottle after they headed to uh, to Fayetteville and beyond? Yeah, look, and I've seen a lot of people that had tweets saved in their drafts ready to pounce on LSU if they had a performance like this. And I've heard people that I respect say, oh, man, yeah, th this team was much closer to that than they were the number five team in the country. This team, if K.J. Jefferson plays against Arkansas, uh, plays against LSU for Arkansas, they lose that game. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. K.J. Jefferson lost to Liberty the week yeah. before. LSU found a way to win that game, and I realized LSU had challenges, but let's not act like they're a bad football team. They had a bad performance. They had a performance and not match up with what they did, but – are, are they the most consistent football team? No. Uh, are they way ahead of schedule? Yes. Did they play maybe above their heads talent-wise? Yeah, absolutely. Brian Kelly talked about it. They played that well because of the traits that they followed, maybe not necessarily the talent that they had on that roster. Um, and so, like, I'm not jumping off the LSU bandwagon. I still think that they have, you know, so much to play for, obviously, this weekend. And, yeah, it was a, it was a bad performance. There's no excuse for it. I'm not making an excuse. You got beat. That game, honestly, in the second half, wasn't very close. I mean, Texas A&M pulled away from you. And there's moments in that game that we could preview. Um, certainly, it's 17-10 at halftime. You come out three and out. You get the ball back. You score 17 all. You get another three and out. You get the ball back. I'm like, oh, here it goes. This is the second half LSU team that we saw against Mississippi State, that we saw against Ole Miss. And then you have a fumble. They pick it up. They go the other way for uh, six, and the game was over. The game was over because LSU right now, CD, they're close to it, but they're not there. They're not able to handle a sudden change like that in that game when the other team already built up momentum in that game at their home stadium. LSU hadn't played well on the road this year, right? You, you look at the Florida game. There was points in that game they struggled. They almost gave that game back to Florida. You look at um, the game against Auburn on the road, an awful first half. They come back in the second half. So there's uh, – it wasn't a, a, an away game, but Florida State being a neutral site game, they didn't play well in that one. So they haven't played – they've played they, – look, I don't want to say they haven't played well. They found a way to win a lot of those games. And, in fact, they won a bulk of those games. But they're still a little bit off and a little bit a ways away. Now, I think it comes as soon as next year where they can handle a situation like that, like Georgia. Georgia right now can have a bad sleepwalking type of start against Georgia Tech and still find a way to win and still find a way to pull away late Yeah, because that's who they are. That's who they've built to be. 
LSU's not there yet. They can't have a performance like that and expect to win, even against a bad Texas A&M football team. And so there's a lot of things we could point to. Gap integrity defensively. I Watching it on TV, I thought, oh, they must have got pushed around. That w- wasn't really the case. When you look at the, the game, LSU – gave up 1.7 yards before contact to Texas A&M. And they average about 1.5, or maybe I have those flip-flop. They gave up, I think they gave up maybe 1.5, and they averaged 1.7, so it was actually better than the average. So that's not great push by Texas A&M, but what LSU did is they overran everything. I don't know if it was the old-school nature of the offense, but they over-pursued things. And when you over-pursue CD and a good running back, which they have a great one in College Station, and he hits the gap in which you over-pursue, then he's only facing half a body of a defender. You're not squaring him up. And a great running back like A-Chain is going to take half that body and run right through it. And that's what he did. 21 missed tackles for LSU. Yeah, that, the, that, next, the next highest on the entire season was 12 against Tennessee. Yeah. You almost doubled up your missed tackles because A-Chain was taking advantage of you having half a shoulder in the hole. He's running right through it. And that, to me, that was the story of the game. I think it's also interesting, too. We've celebrated Harold Perkins Jr. so much this season, and rightly so for all he's been able to accomplish. But we've forgotten that he's a true freshman. And you saw a lot of times where he had some busts and assignment in what he was doing and trying to execute, uh, largely because of what Texas A&M did with some of their personnel groupings and the way that you move people around and where they, they had him split out at times. So, it was a it was a good coaching job by Texas A and M, uh, and like you said, the margin is very small still for for LSU. How about that? The old school nature of the offense, the old school nature for the offense for Texas A and M, like it actually I think helped them in this game. Like LSU didn't look like they knew how to handle twenty one personnel with a tight end with a fullback. Uh, Texas A and M's fullback actually played really well in the game, and so how about that, Jimbo? Going out there with that old school offense, it paid off in one of those contests. And so, hey, Jimbo, after the game, too, he's like, yeah, I told you. Man. I told you, man. That's- <laughs> hey, that might have been the worst thing that could have happened for, for Texas oh, a and I, I was wondering that after the game. Is that a good thing or a bad thing that they went out there and took care of LSU? Well, think about it. Like, what that does in terms of hope, the A&M fans now, again, oh, look at Connor Wegman. Look at our, yeah. our defensive improvement. Look at all these things we can point to. And here we go again, getting that hype train yep. going for 2023. I don't know if that's a great thing, but certainly, you know, the idea of, hey, the offense does work. Maybe we don't have to tweak it as much. Maybe we don't need to bring an outsider in. I don't know if that's necessarily a great thing for the program's uh, long-term future either. I think they have to, right? They have to bring somebody from within. I know they've already moved on from some of their offensive staff, but that offensive staff has been together for a long time, and sometimes it's just good to get away from each other. I mean, Two of the offensive coaches that are with Jimbo were GAs with Jimbo when I was a freshman at LSU. Wow. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And that's nothing against James Coley and Damian Craig. I think James Coley is a hell of a football coach. But sometimes, like, you got to get away from each other. You got to bring in new, you got to bring in fresh ideas. And I fully expect that Texas A&M will do that because you're right. Like, there's going to be a lot made of this game and, and what they were able to do in this game and in this contest. And as you look at that 2023 schedule for them, New Mexico at Miami, UL Monroe. So there's uh, Abilene Christian at the end of the season. So non-conference wise, there's nothing right there that really makes you nervous and you're going to be favored in all those games. And so I'm sure by the time we get to Atlanta, not this weekend, but the next time for SEC media days, the hype train will be full steam ahead. The hype train is uh, always full steam ahead, <laughs> seemingly there in, in College Station. So um, where do you want to go next, man? I think we should go ahead and get to it. Let's let's pregame. Let's get to the SEC championship game. We know who it is. It is number one, Georgia facing off against LSU. And this is an unique SEC championship game, I think, to say the least. The last time there's been a three-loss team in Atlanta was 2016 Florida. The last time a three-team, three-loss team won the SEC championship game was 2001. It was LSU over Tennessee. So typically, CD, we don't see a team that has three losses in Atlanta challenging for the SEC title. It definitely takes a little of the luster off. Um, you know, we're used to being kind of the focal point of championship Saturday and, uh, now, I don't know that there's any real game that, that looks like it's the focal point. There's a lot of mismatches on paper uh, in, in these conference championship games. But 
it, it, it definitely would have felt a little bit bigger with an LSU win and a potential college football playoff spot on the line for the Tigers. Um, you know, much would, like would, what, it, would you have change your opinion though? Not to cut you off, would it have changed your opinion about this game if LSU would have won? Of who who might be able to win? Yes. I, maybe because I I've been on that LSU tra- train. I think that's why I, I feel so deceived is because I bought into <laughs> it. Like I, I'm I'm not joking. I legitimately felt let down. Like I had had been sold a little bit of a bill of goods, and and I felt like a little bit of a a sucker. But I, and I I maybe I think I think selfishly I had hoped maybe that they could win, and so we get two teams into the college football playoffs, but. In reality, I don't think yeah. it, it really changes many of the matchups as we look at the the head to head and and the and all of these different um, tales of the tape. I don't know that it changes much, to be honest. Yeah, I think when you take a look at the matchups, the matchups are the matchups. If LSU was able to get a one point victory over Texas A and M, I still think the line. I think it was at fifteen and a half before they lost, and then moves up to seventeen and a half, yeah. so a couple of points but not like this huge swing where it was 13 and a half all the way up to 17 and a half. It's going to be an uphill battle for LSU. I mean, let's make no bones about it. Uh, This Georgia team is the ultimate team. And I mean that in the biggest compliment I can give, and I've said this all week on many platforms, if you went around the 13 other campuses in the SEC, you would have a bulk of fans not be able to name four players on Georgia's offense and four players on Georgia's defense. Yeah, And I mean that in a very complimentary way because they play the ultimate team brand of football. And in 2022 CD, by God, that is so hard to do, but they play for each other. They play for Kirby. They play for that staff and they don't really care who gets the credit. The guys that did care aren't there anymore. Yeah. Right. And they have exactly who they want. And it's fun to watch, man. It's certainly defensively, like offensively, like we can give you the names. We can give you some receivers. We can give you Stetson Bennett. We can get you McIntosh. But I don't know if the casual fan could give you that defensively. People in our industry couldn't give you names. Like, I truly believe that. I think they just watch Georgia. They're like, oh, yeah, they're dominant. Well, why are they dominant? Tell me some names. And like, oh, well, you know him. It's like, yeah. no, no, tell me about him. And they yeah. can't do it. Yeah. And that's because like George is just, it's just, just an ultimate team effort and they don't care who gets the credit. It might be you this week. It's you next week. It's me the other week. Yeah. And to me, that's dangerous for any team playing Georgia. Yeah. No, it definitely. And I think that's part of when, when you go back and talk about all right, who the sec coach of the year is. I think a lot of people forget about Kirby smart and you know, good, luck, it, good luck choosing that by the way, this year. Good luck. Oh, it's going to be tough. I, I, full disclosure, Kirby Smart would be my selection. I mean, the guy's won 27 straight regular season games. He's coming off a national championship. I know that doesn't have anything to do with this year, but when you lose 15, 15 draft players, choices, yeah. don't bring anybody into the portal. Hey, don't, hey, here's the best part about it is they don't lose a lot into the portal either. With all of those highly recruited players on the, the, the roster, yep. and to look around and see Alabama with what they've struggled with from a depth standpoint, and that hasn't been the case in, in Athens, Kirby does a great job of not only recruiting, but re-recruiting the roster to make yeah. sure that they keep people there and that they understand their role. And, and they, they roll so many guys in there, particularly on defense, that guys are getting a little bit of a taste. They might not be starters until later, but they're getting a chance to get their beak wet a little. I think if LSU wants any opportunity to win this game, they have to play so free. And what I mean by that, like, go back and watch LSU. Like, they played tight in the first half against Mississippi State. They played free the second half. Tight in the first half against Ole Miss, free in the second half. Auburn, same situation. Florida State, even, same situation. And the only game they played free the entire time where it looked like they felt like it didn't matter what the other team did, they were going to be the better team was Alabama. For four quarters and in overtime, they were playing free. They were taking chances. They played with recklessness, but in a very controlled way, if that makes any sense, right? They weren't worried about making the mistake. That's the only chance they have in this game. LSU has talent. Make no mistake about it. They've got Jimmys and Joes, right? They're going to win some individual matchups in this game. But as a team, if they want to have success, they just have to go. And I'm not talking about running a double reverse pass to the quarterback type of free. I'm talking about just going out there with a game plan believing in the game plan and executing the game plan because we've seen certainly offensively and Jaden Daniels do that. Look at the Florida game. Look at the Ole Miss game. Look at the uh, Alabama game. Like that is a free Jaden Daniels that goes out there free spirited and just plays. 
he has to do that in this game. There's no double clutching against Georgia because if you yeah. do that, you'll be on the ground. Yeah, I spent a lot of time going back and watching that that uh, LSU offensive tape against Texas A&M. There's there's a lot of things that that bother me, and I you know you and I texted a lot about this the other day. The receivers is where my eye goes to first. Crucial drops in third oh, down situations. Two big ones. Um, inability to separate against press coverage. Um, and on the, the few times that they did separate down the field, you know, Jaden Daniels either doesn't have time to throw or doesn't look, you know, they have a quarter, perfect quarters beater on. They don't, they don't see the post there. The corner probably would have been open as well. Just a, a complete failure in the passing game to where your offense had very little explosiveness. Yeah. You had some, some explosive runs, but yeah, you could run little. the ball, but the game didn't dictate that you could run the uh, the ball because the other team was scoring. Exactly. Yeah. So you couldn't hit any downfield passes, something you'd done pretty well going back to the Florida game. And, and then that stretch where you were, you were, you know, looking like a different team, but I, I just go back to, you know, think about if you can't, if you can't separate against man coverage against A&M, you will not going to do well <laughs> against Georgia because right. the, they will, they will man you up. They did yes. it to t Tennessee. I think Tennessee's longest completion in that game was an 18 yard catch. I mean, it, it th it's going to be tough sledding in that respect. And even worse, trying to protect Jaden Daniels. You talk about not clutching. You ain't going to have time to clutch. You, you will not have time to forget throwing into tight windows. You're going to have three or four different bulldogs down your throat before you have time <laughs> to throw. If you try to clutch. I mean, speaking of Georgia players that probably don't get the recognition they deserve, and a lot of fans don't know those names. I mean, you look at like Christopher Smith, you look at Starks. Ringo gets a little bit of praise, but not enough, not to the player that I think he is. And so that defensive backfield, like we talk about the front seven, the defensive backfield, yeah. like to your point, CD, like the Tennessee game, they dominated a group of receivers that at that point have been dominating everybody they played. Yeah. You know what it's called? Physicality. And that's mm -hmm. what you saw Texas A&M do. Texas A&M, you know, one of the things when you're playing wide receiver, when you're releasing against press coverage, you've got to find a way to get your, your shoulders vertical. You've got to find a way to get hip to hip with a defender. And more times than not, it was LSU receivers getting pushed to the sideline because they couldn't get in that yep. hip to hip position you need so bad. Yeah. And if you're looking to run the football against Georgia, good luck. I mean, it's just it's not something that a lot of teams have had success against. So let me throw this to you, CD. Let me let me go ahead. Let me keep my purple and gold glasses on and let me throw it to you. What do you think the game plan should be for LSU to have success? Well, I, I think you have to have Jaden Daniels involved in the run game early. You know, in that first quarter, you didn't see much of it. Some of it was because AM, you know, gave reads, gave looks yeah. to to force him to give the ball up. Uh, you saw him, I, I want to say that was the second quarter. They ran a, a nice um, you know, kind of quarterback sweep to the left that uh, they were able to get numbers on that side yeah. and create a, nice, create a nice alley. I think you have to be creative in getting him involved in the run game. Um, but I, I, I think you're, you're, you're not going to be able to take your steps and throw. I, I think you're going to have to move him around a little bit and try to keep that, that uh, Georgia defense from knowing, you know, exactly where their rush point is as well. Cause I'm not so sure those freshman tackles will be able to hold up if you keep dropping back in the pocket time and time again. All right, what about on the other side of the ball? What Am I wrong? I mean, you tell me. You know this team better than I do. What, what, no, I, what look, I, I mentioned playing free. I think you have to do some of the quarterback run stuff, but you also you don't try to win the game on one play. Like, create a package of plays like you did against Alabama. You only took three shots against Alabama. You beat them by executing what they were giving you. And you use Mason Taylor at the tight end position. You uh, use Kayshawn Booty in the slot where he was catching intermediate passes. You weren't chunking the ball down the field. Like, it doesn't always have to be a deep shot. Like, create a package of plays and a set of routes that you feel good about. And if the defense wants to give you seven yards to set up second and three, take it. And I didn't feel like they did a good job of that against Texas A&M. Um, you know, they, they didn't run the football early when they could have. Texas A&M has the worst rush defense in the SEC by 22 yards. And you didn't take advantage of that early. You came out throwing the football. Know what you have advantages at. Try to take full advantage of those advantages. And a seven-yard play is good. You're not going to win the game on one play. So for me, like that's going to be key is the scheme, the schematics of it, uh, the initial 15 plays coming off yeah. that script, I think are going to be very impactful in this game. And so 
you can't you can't have the game plan that you've had at some points in this year where you run seven man protection and you run three man routes and they're all deep routes because this Georgia team is not going to allow you to complete those passes. Even yeah. with seven man in protection, sometimes that actually adds people to the count because guys green dog guys add to the blitz. They, they end up bringing themselves. And so for me, like come out with quick hitters, get some confidence, get things going, throw a bubble, throw a now, throw some of those things to get your quarterback comfortable in the game plan. Yeah. How much do you think, you know, Georgia's not typically a, a, a pressure team. They're, they're rarely bringing extra rushers. They did a lot of it against Tennessee, far more than what their, yeah. their normal personality is. How much do you think they do that against LSU? I actually think it's going to be a high number. I think it's going to be a high volume. I mean, don't don't you try to test young football players, talented football players, but wouldn't you try to test them and see what you – now, I say that because I know, like, young football players, obviously their head's going to be spinning. It's going to be a different scenario for them. But also I could watch the Tennessee game. I could watch the Florida State game. And basic games gave LSU's offensive line some trouble. Mm -hmm. And you know who you have running in those games if you're Georgia's defensive front. So it's, it's going to be a little bit of pick your poison. I wonder which one they're going to do more. They're going to bring extra bodies or they're just going to run games up front. Yeah. I, I I'm, I'm kind of of the opinion that they won't at least early on. Let's, let's see what we can mm -hmm. do to, to, to confuse, you know, just bring in four or maybe bring in five, but let's, let's not put ourselves in positions to where, I mean, they do such a great job of, of showing pressure you know, dropping guys out, overloading protections to one side that I don't know that they really need to, especially with some of those young guys on that offensive line that they're going to be going up against. It's going to be, it's going to be a confusing situation. You know, if, if you're, you're having to look at what uh, Georgia does, they, cause they do it, they disguise well and they do it fast and it, they don't, they don't make mistakes much on that side of the ball. I wonder what George is going to do offensively in this one. Um, you know, knowing Kirby like we do, it almost feels like he he'll slow the game down and not give the LSU offense the ability to have a ton of possessions. A&M did it last week, and you have the Jimmys and Joes to be able to do so even more so than they do. He's already done that. I mean, he's kind of reverted to that as the season's gone on. Right. Go back, look at the 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 Kentucky game. That's kind of what that game became. Auburn game was kind of like that as well. Look at what uh, yeah. he did last week against Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech, they, they threw three three balls to wide receivers. They had three catches for 16 yards, the wideouts yeah. did, which is another discussion altogether. But, <laughs> like, they, they didn't have to throw. And I think, yeah. you know, when they know they're better than another team, I don't think that they 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 deviate much from their conservative nature that uh, that Kirby has kind of built them into. All right, so they've been able to dictate the pace of every game that they've played in. There's no question about it, even a team like Oregon. Outside of Tennessee, though, is this the best team that Georgia will face talent-wise? I mean, I'll run I, this schedule. Like, this is a podcast. This isn't a live show. We don't have any breaks here. Oregon, Sanford, South Carolina, Kent State, Missouri, Auburn, Vandy, Florida, Tennessee, Mississippi State, Kentucky, Georgia Tech. Uh, yeah. And you could even make the argument that LSU has more talent maybe than even Tennessee. Tennessee's a better football team, Vol Nation. Yeah. Don't send me messages. But as far as pure talent, I mean, this is either one or two, in my opinion. Am I being biased here? No, I think you're right. As you were reading that schedule off, it, it became even more illustrative that that is the case. You know, I, I, I think you're spot on there. And – Honestly, as much time as we spend kind of down talking, all right, who who's Ohio State's best win? Who's Michigan's best win? I don't know that, like, who's Georgia's best win, really, you know? Yeah, I mean, Other than Tennessee? Yeah, the Oregon. Now, Oregon had some close, tough losses against Washington and Oregon State to finish their season. But, uh, you know, that one that still holds some weight. Now, as far as teams that are – you know, ranked when they played them, Tennessee and Oregon are, that's it. That's the right. list. Who, who's Alabama's best team? Who, who's Alabama's best win? Is it, is it Texas? Texas maybe. And that's, that's not that impressive, right? Maybe, yeah. maybe Mississippi state and eight and four Mississippi state team. Like, 
I think the problem is, is we're used to looking at this lens in the SEC and quite honestly, outside of probably just Georgia, there's a lot of inconsistencies yeah. and the yeah. inconsistencies have led to a lot of four and four records. That's why you have a three loss team in the SEC championship game. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. why, that's why it hadn't happened in six years since Florida was able to do it. And I asked that question because I'm curious, I'm curious what that talent that LSU has. Now, some of it showed up every week. Some of it showed up half the time. Some of it hasn't really been there this season. But how much of that talent can give you some advantages in this game? I mean, B.J. Ojolari, very talented player. One of the best edge rushers that you'll see in the country. Harold Perkins, true freshman, unbelievable talent. Will Campbell, unbelievable talent. I mean, we could go down the list. I mean, I think a lot of our listeners know the names. John Emery, unbelievable talent. Kayshawn Booty, you know, not been who we thought he would be, but we know the talent is in there and um you know i'm curious to see how georgia handles that talent because they've been so damn dominant over everybody that they've played for a, a, a majority of the season outside of the missouri game i mean even kentucky was 16 to 6 but did you ever truly feel no. threatened that they were going to lose that game i didn't yeah missouri's exactly. the only one that i felt like they had a chance to lose yeah I mean, and, and that came because of self-inflicted errors you turned the ball over three times i think in the first half alone yeah. maybe the first quarter and you find yourself down. I mean, not taking anything away from Missouri. They did a nice job, particularly on their defensive line and penetration uh, all, all evening. But a lot of what you had happen, the reason why they were in that game was self-inflicted wounds. And I think that goes back to what we talked about earlier. Like, why Kirby knows that they're better than everybody else. He knows that their defense is not going to give up a whole lot of points. So why would you take the chance on, on doing things that are yeah. going to potentially put you in a bad situation and maybe have more of those self-inflicted wounds? What's Kirby's motivation this week? Because Kirby's great at giving motivation. We heard the scenes from the locker room against Tennessee about that game. Even though, you know, they came in as a favorite. Everybody was talking Tennessee. He used it as motivation. He does a great job of using it. Is it as simple as we didn't win the SEC championship last year and now we have an opportunity to go do it? Because you're the heavy favorite. I mean, you're favored by three scores in this one. So, you know, how do you try to use or what motivation do you use if you're Kirby? Because they've been so locked in all season long. Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of it here, Chris Smith's been a part of four SEC East winning teams, still hasn't won the SEC championship after losing in uh, 2018, 2019, and 2021. Like, that's the motivation right there. It's like yeah. teaching. This is the, what the, like, so uh, this will be the 31st SEC championship game. But, you know, you've had, it started in 92. You've had, that Antonio Langham game that I was a part of was uh, mm -hmm. was an all-timer. Um, you go back and, and look at, uh, I believe, uh, uh, the, the Georgia LSU Aaron Murray game was 2012, I think, right? We, Yeah, LSU and Georgia have faced off, I know, in 05. Five times. Was it, I know, 11. Yeah, it was 11, right? Because that was the year LSU played in the SEC championship game, beat Alabama in the regular season, then lost to them in the, uh, in the championship. Right. Yeah. I thought there was, there were some special there, there, numbers about like the, the, the 22, the 92, 2002, 2012 yeah. and 2022. Um, but you know, I, I, I think this, that's, that's the motivation is like, Hey, look at the great history of this game. Look at the, the, what it means an opportunity to get another ring. We haven't been able to do it and just sell the hell out of that because I, I really think that's, you know, that this is a team that otherwise yeah. doesn't seem to, they don't seem to, to have a whole lot of emotion really. I mean, they, they have moments <laughs> yeah. of moments of being like disinterested, which bothers me like last week, early in the game, I thought they looked disinterested. You talked about Keely Ringo. Keely Ringo is an unbelievable talent when motivated. He's incredible, but when he seems disinterested, he can be, really average looking a, a guy that doesn't look like he's interested at times in tackling and some of those, you know, short throws on the outside, the receiver screens. Like, yeah, I want to see him interested because he is an absolute beast when he's locked in. I think they will be, I think not winning it last year, even though you won the natty, I think they will be locked in. Like a lot of people are asking me this week, knowing that they can lose in this game and still make the CFP. Will that keep them motivated? I'm like, yeah, no. they, they've been through that. They've been through that last year. I, I think there's something different. I think they want to go out there and obviously win an SEC championship game. I think LSU will be motivated. I don't think LSU losing 
hell, that might have even amped it up. I mean, you were balls to the wall. Everything you got, throw the kitchen sink at them in this situation. Um, like I expect LSU to look much better than they did a week ago. I think they're motivated to go out there and win an SEC championship, even though you didn't have this epic season where you won 11 games in the regular season. So I'm like, I'm actually expecting at least for a large portion of the game, a competitive game. Like I truly believe that it's not because I, I played at LSU. I've, I've come on this podcast and told you when I thought LSU was going to get boat raised. I don't feel like it's going to be one of those situations, at least not in the first three quarters of the game. If Georgia ended up maybe finding a way late, I think, I think it's going to be a quality football game. Maybe that's hopeful. Maybe that's me, you know, wishing because we're all going to be on the trip and we want to watch a great football game, but I think it's going to be competitive. Yeah. I, the problem I have has, as I look at every single matchup, there's very few that I can even label as being pushes, let alone give to advantage to LSU. Like tell, tell me in, in maybe the Georgia receivers against the LSU secondary. If maybe? LSU secondary is healthy, that's, that's a, that's yeah. a, like you had Jay Ward, who is a free safety starting your corner against Texas A&M. That's not good. Yeah. That is not what you want. Um, Sage Ryan is a player that was a five-star player coming in. He, you know, he's been in position to make plays, hasn't made the plays. And last week on those two touchdown passes by Wegman, that was Sage Ryan. Uh, Bernard Converse missed that game. That's an all-Big 12 player a year ago at Oklahoma State that's been key for you. You've moved him around. He missed that game. Nobody wanted to talk about it because they thought LSU was going to show up and win. You miss that player. LSU's not in a spot. They can't miss players. Yeah. Georgia can miss players. Georgia is copy and paste. LSU's not in that position. So until I see CD, who's exactly like fully healthy out there, yeah, I understand what you're asking. It's tough to say, okay, where do you have some of the advantages? I mean, there's a couple of defensive players for LSU that I think would start on any team in the country. Is it an advantage? I don't know. I know they're really good football players. I know Jaqueline Roy and B.J. Jalori and Harold Perkins would play for almost anybody, but you have to find some, you know, advantages for you off that talent. And that's, yeah. that's going to be the question. All right. You want to, uh, you want to make a prediction? It, it feels like CD it to me with Georgia wanting to control the pace, but the morning to play a slow place uh, pace, at least that's what I think. I think it's going to be something like 24 to 13, uh, 24, 14. That 24. sounds like a uh, old school sec game uh, back in the day. Right? <laughs> I just, that's I don't know. I can't get it to a high scoring matchup. I can't even get it to like a, a blowout one way or the other. I can't term, see it being 42, 31. What's the total. Do we know big term? I know we got the you said 51. The 51. So it's 15 and a half and 51. 17 and a half is a 17 yeah, and 17 and a half and 51. It's mm. a lot of points, man. A lot of points. Uh oof. yeah, I don't stay tuned. We, we, we release our best bets on Friday night. That's one of those things that really asterisk more like Saturday morning, but we'll we'll get those out. Maybe before. get some props since there's only one game. I have to give you some prop bets. Some oh, I'm props planning on well. sending you guys a full list of props. Oh yeah, nobody out. likes All a right. good player prop like Big Turp. Oh, uh, you know right. it. Let's plan on that then. Yeah. What about you? I mean, tell us tell us what you think. I know you're probably going to save like your actual score prediction probably for uh, you know TV, the glamorous side of things. There, Chris Doring with Peter Burns on Friday morning, but at least give us kind of how you think it plays out. Well, let, don't let's don't act like, you know, you're not going to make your first you know, public person in person appearance on SEC this morning too. We got uh, Will this be my first in person? I I think you're I think you're right. You I mean, we've done on, that we've done that show together about yes, 500 but times. But your yeah, local you show has kind of gotten in the way now, so uh, I I think we're, you weren't on set with us in Atlanta at Media Days, right? Uh I had you know what? A couple of years ago, I was on set with you for one segment when it was in Birmingham, like 2018. It's actually the first time you and I, I met in person. I, I'm talking about this year. You haven't been on with us oh, at no. all this year. No, right? I haven't been. I haven't been on in two years because T-Bob yeah. sold me away. <laughs> well, this will be the uh, the debut, so we're looking forward to uh, to having you on set. That'll be, I think, 9:30 a.m. Eastern time. You'll be on a whole. Look, half we're going to be together uh, tomorrow night. Yes, uh, we'll we'll be fully hydrated um, <laughs> if you will so you just tell me what time and you make sure that i'm up and i'll be there 
All right. Well, we're looking forward to having you on there. I think, I think Georgia wins. I, I could see it being a, a, a Kentucky similar type game to where, you know, you feel like Georgia dominates, but the, yeah. the score tells kind of a different story. All right, that's going to do it for the championship week edition of the podcast. A little programming note, if you're worried because we didn't cover your team today, that was with uh, this intention in mind because it is championship week to talk more about the SEC championship game. But don't worry, we will have a full regular season recap of your favorite SEC team and also maybe previewing what the future looks like for your SEC team in the next episode of the podcast. Remember, you can watch us now on YouTube. Just search pre-gaming the SEC, the handle on social media at pre-gaming the SEC, Instagram and Twitter, of course, Spotify and Apple for the audio podcast version of pre-gaming the SEC. And also brought to you by walk on sports bistro. Got to throw that out there. What are we doing? Walk dash owns.com to find a location near you. CD. Big Terp's not coming with us, which we got questions about that. I mean, any chance he gets to go to Atlanta, he's usually yeah. all about it. But, CD, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Yes, can't wait to be we with you in the ATL. Can't wait to be with all our uh, our great SEC fans as well. We appreciate uh, the support here on this podcast as we continue to grow it amount amongst this uh, the southeastern portion of the United States this last two years. All right, and we will see you next time for pre-gaming the SEC.